everybody, welcome to Drive Through Review 266. Today we're going to talk about Game of Thrones, the board game, and this is the second edition. Uh, and I've had this game for quite a while, and it's uh, somewhat difficult to get to the table, kind of because of the length. Uh, it's not really that long of a game, but also I've wanted to try it at different player counts, which I've had the opportunity to do. Um, because kind of a heads up going into this one is, player count is really going to matter. I'll talk more about what I think about the player counts in the review, but I really wanted to try it with uh, different player counts. Because now I've had a chance to play it a few more times, and really just really kind of reveal itself to me in some ways over the multiple plays of how the different sort of wrinkles and twists and turns on some of the traditional I guess war game ideas uh, and how it kind of is bent and tweaked uh, to sort of suit the theme but also makes it very interesting to play and really adds a lot of dynamics to how the game's going to unravel, how the players are going to deal with each other. So there's some real fascinating um, you know, wrinkles and stuff like that, just from a mechanical perspective of this game, that really translate into that whole sort of, you know, screw you, I'm going to stab you in the back, and the Starks are going to betray the Lannisters, and vice versa, and all those different types of things. So, uh, let's jump into that, and then I'll come back and tell you more about what I think of it. Okay, so here's the board, and I haven't gone to the trouble to set it up, because it's a little bit involved of a setup, uh, but I definitely will go over everything that's shown here. So first you have the map of Westeros here, and you got the various locations where the different houses will start. If we zoom in here, uh, you'll have uh, the Lannisters and the Greyjoys, kind of how they're set up there. You have various different types of units that you're going to start the game with. You have these little foot soldiers here. These are just your footmen. These are going to basically add one to combat. You have the knights there. These are these little horse looking guys. These are going to add two to combat. You also have boats and then also siege engines which you can create later. Uh, everybody has the same type of units. Each uh, house or player gets a uh, little starting sort of defensive fortress here so you can see this is a little built-in defense value of two there in Lannisport. Now there also will be based on the number of players uh, some of these kind of spread around the board in various places so in a four to six player game the Irie is going to basically be sort of a neutral uh, army that you have to beat and you have to have a six attack value. Some of these will actually be uh, blocked out on a three player game there so if we take a look there uh, you can see that you just put that there and basically you can't enter uh, the three towers at all in a three player game. So the houses are fixed. So on a three player game, it's always Lannisters, Baratheons, and Starks. And then as you add more players, you're going to add more houses. So I found that the game actually scales pretty well that way. Um, I'll talk more about that in the review. Uh, but it, you basically have sort of fixed areas that you're going to be sort of uh, vying over based on the player count. And you definitely do not want to neglect your naval support and attacks and things like that. That's actually going to be either really annoying for you if you're on the receiving end of that or it's going to be uh, you know pretty cool to utilize. So you're going to start with some troops set up on the board and the main thing that you're going to be trying to get to win are these different structures here. So you can see we have strongholds there with these little castles that uh, have a little bit of a tower on top and then these little mini castles here and those are going to be what you're trying to get to win the game. So you can see here Lannister currently just randomly has one uh, fortress that they control and as they start to control more and more and more they're going to get more uh, the Greyjoys will get more and this is how you're going to track it if somebody hits seven they instantly win the game just like that otherwise we're going to keep track of the rounds here and once the tenth round is over then whoever has the most uh, fortresses and or castles there uh, wins and then there's a bunch of whole mess of tiebreakers after that. So after you set up the board where your units are going to be uh, you're going to start the game. Now the first round you're not going to do much of anything in terms of events or anything like that. Um, so I'll talk about that in a second. But the first thing you're going to do is be placing out these order tokens here. And so you can see these are face down. You can put them like that and everybody's going to place these on various locations on the board where they have at least one unit. So at these little sort of porcelain marble looking units where you ha wherever you have a unit you can put these face down and then simultaneously everybody's going to flip these up and then kind of execute them in a certain order. 
Uh, the players also are going to get these power tokens. They have these with their different sigils on there. You start with five of these behind your shield, and then the rest, you know, sort of off to the side, you'll be able to sort of generate these. These are kind of like money, kind of a generic sort of catch-all resource. Kind of interesting how these work. Uh, these serve multiple purposes in the game, which is really cool. Uh, I'll talk more about these later. So you start with five of these, and then the first round, you're just going to be out here kind of placing uh, orders on the various spots. So Lannister maybe will place an order to maybe move the boat in there to attack Greyjoy right away. I don't know why they would do that. Uh, but they maybe do something there and then place an order here maybe to muster some units if they can or march some units here, different things. So you're going to place those, everybody's going to reveal them and then resolve them in a certain order. So let's quickly go over what all those possible orders are and then we'll jump into some more of the game. So if you look here, each house has the exact same 15 order tokens and you've got three of each type and basically what you're going to do is you're going to flip all these up after everybody's put them down and said okay everybody's ready and then you're basically going to resolve them in the order that I have here pretty much. So the first thing you're going to resolve are any raid tokens. So let's for example say we had a raid token here and a support token there. So what the raid token is going to do is it's actually going to basically destroy that support token. So the raid tokens can destroy other raid tokens. They can also destroy support tokens, that's what these fists are, or these power tokens here. Now, the if you notice, some of these have stars here on the bottom of them. This one here with the star, it, it can actually destroy a defense token. So it's kind of like a preemptive strike kind of thing. Keeps things really dynamic as far as the order placement goes. But the, you're going to resolve all of these first, and you're going to do this in turn order. I'll explain how turn order is going to work here in a second. But whoever goes first resolves a, a raid token. The second player resolves at least a raid token. If you don't have a raid token, it skips over you and goes back to the first player. And then you go all the way down the line doing one token at a time until somebody, uh, or until everybody runs out of raid tokens. You're going to, after that, you're going to do the same thing with the march tokens here. You can see there's three of these. The first one is a minus one. There's a plus zero. And the one here with a star is a plus one. Now the things with the stars is you can't always place the ones with the stars. I'll talk about that more in a minute, but you can actually see these are definitely beefier uh, versions of the other ones. So all you're going to do when you do a march here is actually going to move troops from an adjacent area to another area or, you know, move a boat from, you know, one of these areas out into another area like so. Now the other thing that you can do here is let's say, uh, for argument's sake, we had some boats here and we wanted to kind of do a quick march for these guys here. They can actually kind of daisy chain and march all the way down here. So instead of taking like two march actions to get down to control uh, this fortress here, they can actually move across all of these here. So if these guys had a march token there, take and move them. They're going to go all the way down here, boom, and take that. Now, if there was another pair of troops here or some more, you would go in and you would actually have combat. And this modifier here is going to change how combat is. So you, you, again, you've only got three march tokens. You've got to figure out which one uh, you want to be the, you know, your strongest combat. Another one you maybe won't be quite as strong. So this guy's would come in here with a minus one. And you're always going to resolve combat immediately. And then once you resolve any combat, then you're going to move down in turn order, resolve any march tokens that they have, and so on. So this combat is pretty interesting. Uh, it's really interesting, I should say. So if you look at these other tokens here, these aren't actually going to get resolved unless combat happens. They don't really trigger an event or a move or anything. But here we have a defense token. So let's set up sort of a pseudo combat here. So let's say we've got this here. We'll move this over here. And these guys have now moved in, remember, with a minus one. These guys flipped and revealed they had a defense plus one on this side. And let's say they had some other units here, uh, and that's showing a support token there. So what you're going to do is you're going to calculate quickly your combat value. Well, the foot units are worth one. The horses are worth two. If you have a siege engine, it's actually going to be worth plus four. You can see it's got the little wheels on there. Uh, or it's going to be worth zero on defense. So they're only good for attacks. And so in this case, we have these guys minus one. So it's two plus one minus one. So they have two. These guys have three, because they've got two plus one, so that's three. The knights are two, the units are one. They got another plus one from the defense, and so now they're up to four. And then you're gonna look at any guys that are around and adjacent to the spot where the combat's taking place, and they're gonna be providing support. So if this guy had this token here, 
he would be support plus one. So he's going to add his support. So he's a one by himself plus another one. So now we're at four and now six. So now it's six to two. So it looks like a landslide for the Greyjoys here. But after you set the initial combat value, again, in this case, six to two, each player is going to reveal a card. And each player has a deck of character cards from the characters that are in their family. So here we have Cersei Lannister, Tyrion, uh, Kevin, the Hound, uh, Sir Jaime, Sir Gregor, and Tywin Lannister. So you're going to take a card and reveal it, flip it up and reveal it simultaneously. Now we can see here Tywin, of course, is going to give us plus four. And then he's also going to get a little special ability. If you win this combat, gain two power tokens. And again, just a reminder... Power tokens are these little sort of generic monies here, and everybody knows Lannisters, all they do is make money. So that's, you know, pretty uh, thematic. Uh, and then Cersei, uh, she is going to, if you win this combat, you may remove one of the losing opponent's order tokens from anywhere on the board. So she's got a kind of interesting little conniving uh, thing there. So each player is going to take and reveal a card. So let's say he reveals Tywin, and what did he come up with? He's going to have uh, Balron Greyjoy. And then the printed combat strength of your opponent's house card is reduced to zero. <laughs> so he's actually worthless than zero. So that was interesting because this would have actually tied us uh, because we would have been six to six uh, based on the numbers there. But he actually swapped them down to zero and added two of his own there. So you're going to resolve combat like that. And then whoever the winner is, a few things are going to happen. But there's a couple other things you can do here with combat. Let me touch on that first before I talk about how it's resolved. Now I'll talk more about these tracks in a minute, but if we look at this track here, there'll be multiple houses on this track. But in this case, let's say Lannister was ahead of Greyjoy on this track somewhere. Uh, so if there was a tie, Lannister would win. And then also the person who has the number one position here is going to get this sword. And there's two ways to kind of play this. First way, you can do this and flip the sword down once per turn to give you a plus one in combat if you need it. Uh, that can come in handy. The other thing you can do is we have these uh, combat cards here. And I've played with these and I've played without them. Uh, I'll talk more about in the review what I think of them. But basically, you flip over one of these for each player and then you add a little bit of combat strength there. So there's a bunch of zeros and ones and twos. I believe there's one, three in there. And you can see there's some icons here, which I'll talk about in a minute. I guess there's two threes. Um, so anyway, so you can do those and flip those up. And then the way the sword works then is you can take a look at your card and you say, ooh, I don't like that. And then you can flip and use the sword and then draw a new one, but you're stuck with that one. And you get that once per turn. So the sword's gonna work differently depending on whether or not you use these cards. So let's say, for argument's sake, the Lannisters had come in and taken this. So uh, the Greyjoys would then have to retreat. You just retreat them to an adjacent, uh, friendly, or neutral spot. And then you're going to lay them down. Uh, they're not going to get necessarily removed, but if somebody were to come in, let's say, from another angle here and attack them, they're basically going to wipe them out. They're not going to contribute to combat. Now, the other thing to know about combat are these swords here as well as these towers. Now the swords are actually going to kill the opponent. So if you win combat, and only if you win combat, these swords will actually remove this number of units from the attacker. So if we'd play this as the Lannisters and one, we would have forced the Greyjoys to remove some. Minus the number of towers the defender plays. So if you lose, I should say the loser, not the defender. If you lose, then you get to basically defend against having your troops removed based on the swords there so these will block so if this was the example which wouldn't exist because these are both lancer cards but if three swords were played against two towers then only one unit would actually have to be totally destroyed so again you're basically going to resolve the marches in turn order you know figure out where the defense and the supports coming from and then kind of quickly resolve that and then play a card uh, the other thing is interesting is you can support other players so if we had another player in here that was supporting uh the lannisters or the Greyjoys, they could kind of choose and you can kind of you know negotiate that kind of a little bit of diplomacy might happen there so you can actually use your troops in support of somebody else and the other thing to keep in mind is the cards as you play these you're going to play these one at a time but once you've played that card it's basically out until you've gone through and played every card and then at which point you're going to collect all your cards back up and then be able to play them again so you're really good one you have to really save and figure out a combat where you're going to actually need that extra points or that extra ability so that's a very interesting way to do combat so after you've resolved, you know, first the raids, then the marches and the support and all that stuff, then you can resolve these power tokens here. 
Now these are basically going to generate you uh, these these tokens here. So if uh, let's say the Greyjoy had put that one there, we flip it up and then he's basically gonna generate you know, one money. Now, if you put that on a spot that has a crown, you get an extra crown. So these are kind of a nice way of generating money, but you can resolve these last after combat and raids uh, because they may not exist <laughs> after all is said and done. Finally, you have the crown here with the star and it actually lets you muster units. I'll talk about a little bit more about mustering in a second, but basically you get two points of mustering in the stronghold and one point in the castle and you can muster uh, boats and footmen for one unit or you can upgrade a footman into a knight for one point and then the uh, the knights and the uh, siege engines are going to cost you two points so really you're only going to be able to upgrade here or you get knights out in the stronghold as well as the siege engines in, in the stronghold and you can actually put the boats in the ports if you're sort of surrounded by um, you know enemy boats you can get them in the ports and then kind of sail out and attack with that but that's, this is basically going to be your the bulk of your turn is figuring out where you're going to place these maybe a little bit of negotiation sort of you know kind of try to outfox your opponent as far as you know where the strong attack may come from and really considering here you know the land layout and you know support from the oceans and in the connected areas and all that stuff and where kind of the juicy areas are now if you look at one other thing here you can see these barrels here and these are basically going to be your supply so let's talk a little bit more about the tracks and the events and things that are going to happen and uh, you know kind of go from there so if you look here on the supply this is basically going to show you how many locations with barrels you have so you can see here we have this one barrel uh, so this is not going to change though until you draw a card that tells you to reevaluate your supply. Now I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but you can see there's those three decks of cards up there, and those are going to trigger basically reevaluations of supply. So even though, let's say, the Lannisters technically may have four areas with barrels, they're not going to actually move this up and be able to take advantage of that until we have a sort of a, a moment and a card that derives that. And that's very, very interesting how that works. Now the other thing how this works is wherever your barrel is, this shows you how many armies you can have. So currently both these players can have three armies. You can tell by the number of flags. And the armies can be of size three, two, and two. So if you have an area where you just have one guy, that's not an army. You can have as many of those as you want. They're gonna be pretty weak and hard to defend, but you can have as many little single units as you want. But once you have more than one, let's say we have this here, this, this is gonna count as two. You just count the number of actual pieces there. So we can have there, you know, in that case, you can have a three, a two, and a two, and the ships count as well. So if you have multiple ships on spot, that again also counts as one of your armies. So again, back here, you can have basically three armies, one of size three, one of size two, and another of size two. As you go up, obviously you can get, you know, a lot more armies and bigger armies. But again, this isn't gonna move until we evaluate some cards. Now, if we look at this track here, I'm gonna talk about this right before we talk about these other cards. If you see here, we talked a little bit about this here and how this sort of army track breaks ties in combat. Uh, there's also the Iron Throne track and the King's Court track. And throughout the game, you're gonna draw cards up here and it's gonna tell you to bid on these. Well, what you're gonna to use to bid are gonna be these power tokens. And quickly, before I forget, um, if you wanna move armies out of a spot and still retain control of it, you can put one of your power tokens and kind of leave that behind. And these are the power tokens that you currently have, not and from the general supply, you've gotta actually have them. So if I wanna move out and maybe I don't really want any forces there, I can take and put a power token there just so I can retain control of that barrel. So when you have a bid on these, then uh, you're going to basically announce before you start bidding how many of these you have available uh, a total and then you're going to take and do a blind bid so everybody's going to take a certain amount put them in their hand and open and reveal so the order is going to be determined now no matter what you pay it's going to go into the bank no matter what even if you don't necessarily outright win because you're going to reorder these based on whoever bid the most all the way down to the least now if there's a tie whoever currently controls this gets this token here and they can break all kinds of sorts of ties except for battles and they can basically decide that. So if we had a bid and Lannister had tied with Greyjoy here, uh, they could say, oh, guess what, I win. So you get to choose the order. So if some other folks were tied further down, in this case, the Lannisters for holding the throne, uh, would basically decide who goes fourth and fifth, let's say. 
you're gonna bid on that. Then you're gonna bid on this one here. Same idea, if there's a tie again, the guy that owns the Iron Throne at that time will also decide who gets to break the ties. And again, you get the sword for combat and break ties in combat. Finally, we have a uh, the Raven here, King's Court. And the winner of that, or the person that's higher on that, is going to get this uh, guy here. And uh, this little token here is going to be put on here for th uh, three, I think three and four player. I think there's three player. I can't remember exactly. Um, but with five and six player, this will for sure come off. Now, if you look here, um, the stars actually is going to tell you how many of these star order tokens you can play. So if you're down here in sixth place on this, you can't play a single star, which is going to really hurt you as far as being able to be more flexible and have more options and have better options available with the tokens you can play. So it's good to be up here because then you get to be able to place the better tokens. You also get this cool raven thing. So once per turn, you can flip this down. Then you can take, after revealing all the order tokens on the table, you can take one off the table and swap it in for another one. So this is actually really handy to do that. Now if you don't do that, then you can go ahead and take a look at the top card of this wildling deck here, and then choose to put it either back on top or put it on the bottom. So why would you do that? So let's talk about these cards here and what they mean. Well after the first round, you're going to flip over the top card of each of these decks here, and then you're going to kind of resolve them in order. Now sometimes these cards are going to have this little wilding symbol here and this is going to trigger this wilding attack uh, value to move up, 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 up. Now whenever you draw a card that says the wildlings attack or this hits 12, the players are going to have to do another bidding and it's feasible to have a card here trigger bidding on this track and then also have a wilding attack in the same round. So then you've got to really kind of consider how you're spending these order tokens here to last you through all three bids on all three tracks plus the upcoming wilding attack plus you want to have some left over so that again you can mark uh, territory there um, you know that you still control for the barrels or the castles and different things like that so these tokens really come into play quite a bit so these will tell you a bunch of different things. Maybe have a wilding attack. Maybe they'll tell you, again, here to reevaluate supply. So everybody's at a point where the realm's sort of at peace. You can sort of, you know, muster up your money and your troops and sort of, you know, reposition. It may also tell you to muster. In that point, you can muster anywhere, not just where you've, again, placed the sole muster token that only a few people are going to be able to use, uh, you know, throughout the game necessarily. But you can go ahead and muster any castle and stronghold that you control. So another kind of thing to reevaluate support. A lot of times those musters will come up and there's really nothing for you to muster. So that's kind of an interesting dynamic there, kind of a fog of war kind of thing. Uh, there's some other things there that like, you know, maybe this, the holder of the sword will be able to get to choose uh, certain uh, order tokens that can be played that turn and things like that. Now, if you have a Wilding Attacks card that comes up here or you hit the 12, everybody's going to bid. And then you need to bid the amount of tokens as a group to equal the number there. So if we're at a 12, we've all got to reveal, we all pay our tokens. If we win, if we get 12 or higher, we're going to look at this here. And so the bottom of the card is a Knight's Watch victory. And then it, the highest bidder is going to get something cool that happens to them. Now, if we don't hit 12, then we're going to have a Wilding victory. And then um, this is going to be the lowest bidder. Something bad is going to happen to them. Really bad. And then everybody else, something just kind of bad is going to happen to them so that's kind of an interesting dynamic as well and these things will really hurt you uh, sometimes sometimes they'll be kind of benign but sometimes they can be you know really game changing in a lot of ways for the winner or the loser so that's uh, pretty much the game there you know you spend most of your time putting out the order tokens and all that kind of stuff uh, you're gonna after round one you're gonna deal with this kind of stuff happening the tracks are very important because again we talk about turn order here this Iron Throne here also deals with the turn order. So the order that you resolve the order tokens, you're going to get a little bit of a more favorable, uh, you know, order if you help hold the Iron Throne. But if you hold the King's Court here, you're going to be able to place out better order tokens. And like any good, you know, kind of war game or area control game, the dynamics of the map are pretty interesting. Um, I'll talk more about this in the review, but, you know, the sea routes are pretty cool. Based on player count, certain areas will be kind of, 
you know should be treated differently and stuff like that so let's go ahead and jump into the review now i've kind of talked uh probably more than i wanted to <laughs> okay i hope you enjoyed the overview i think i went a little bit longer than i wanted to on the walkthrough so if you sat all the way through that thank you very much but i apologize um there's a lot of amazing stuff in this game so let's first just tackle the issue of player count i actually think this game plays just fine at every player count now i know people are going to go set their hair on fire because like the general consensus on the internet says the opposite from what I've read. I disagree wholeheartedly about that and here's why. Because the map scales based on player count. Uh, you know like for three players at least you wall off certain parts of the map. You only use certain houses and the houses are in different proximity to each other. But I think the way that the territories are organized it makes it sense for every player count. Now, you will have certain things that you have to keep in mind with a player count. So for example, let's just take the player count of five. Um, that has every house in it except for Martell. And the Martell's in the south and next to the Tyrell. So the Tyrell can kind of just kind of do their own thing for a little while, unless players are aware of that, and then they can kind of negotiate that to at least put a little bit of thorn in their side so they don't march up the you know, fortress track so quickly. But the Starks also kind of have that a little bit uh, you know, they have a little bit of breathing room on certain player counts, whereas like the Lannisters and the Greyjoys are like right in each other's face, right at the beginning. And the Baratheons are a little bit off to the side, but you know, they, they're going to run into somebody pretty quickly, whether it's the Stark or the Lannisters, and maybe even, uh, well, the Martells or Tyrells. So I think the game works at every single player count. Now, the kind of richness of experience is going to definitely increase with the more players, because with three players, you're like never going to have an issue of I'm going to support this person over this person. I'm trying to think. I think we ca almost had it once in a three player game, but it ended up being like, you know, I'm not going to support either one of you because <laughs> I don't want to piss anybody off. Um, but as you get more and more players, you can totally have that. And that is a nice thing because it can kind of help keep somebody, you know, uh, in reined in and so they don't kind of run away with maybe. Uh, a couple of more fortresses and things like that. So there's definitely a kind of bash the leader thing that can happen here. There's a definite kind of backstabby thing. Uh, again, let's take the five player count where I'm like, hey, Lannisters, you know, if I'm a uh, Greyjoy, this is actually like a real thing, uh, <laughs> go down and, you know, sink down the, the coast there and grab that little castle there. Get that for yourself. You only start with one castle. And uh, I think it's one. Yeah. And they get you know they get stuff another castle i'm just going to move on on land i'm just going to get on sea here i'm going to relax and then they're like no or they're like yeah and then they're like no when <laughs> we flip the the uh, order tokens and then they jack me and i'm like why did you do that <laughs> now he's got all these castles you know neither one of you guys is trying to bother with him so you have that kind of table talk and stuff so that's fun and it's thematic because in game of thrones everybody backstabs each other uh, and please, if you're responding to this on YouTube or Board Game Geek, please, I've only watched the TV show. I haven't read the books, um, so please don't spoil anything for me, I would appreciate it. Um, but it feels very thematic in that sense of how that whole thing works. Um, so apart from player count now, let's talk about the rest of the game. Uh, it's interesting because the game really works against the players in a lot of ways. Like the whole reevaluation of supply. I mean, you know, and the whole mustering thing, that's not going to happen when you want it. You know, you're going to be like, oh, cool, I can muster right here is a footman, you know. And it's just not going to work out. Whereas you're also going to be able to sometimes manipulate that based on holding one of those tokens and being the leader of the track. You can kind of say, oh, okay, hmm, should we evaluate supply? Because that could be one of the choices. Or should we muster? And... You know, you can say, well, okay, let me look at this. So if we muster, I can get a lot of stuff done. So, okay, let's go ahead and muster. Or Lannisters are going to get a ton of mustering happening. So, you know, no mustering this turn. Or you can say no march plus one this turn. Or no defense orders this turn. And those kind of events are going to come up. And that's cool because you can kind of negotiate around that as well. And a little bit about the bidding on the tracks and bidding for the wildlings that are going to go in and basically hinder everybody. You're like, I'm trying to fight this war over here and take over territory and these stupid wildlings are coming up. So it gives it very much like a, a, a feeling of breath kind of out of this world, out of the board, out of the players. It's like, okay, yeah, we're kind of dealing with each other head to head, trying to backstab each other, kind of manipulate each other. But then, oh, the game, <laughs> the, the game is trying to screw us up. 
So you have that kind of, you know, you, you bring your focus back down to the board in that way. Uh, so that's really cool. And because of that, and all those inter 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 interlocking parts, you have all these kind of levers you can pull, like where I put my order token here, do I put my plus one attack there, should I be that, that be a support, and I come in around from this angle. So you have like all of these different kind of things operating on different levels, you know, the player to player, kind of the theme of the events and the wild things and all the different stuff happening, and then you've got kind of these cool little Euroific mechanisms that you can play with. And the game kind of almost evolves from the back to player count from a nice good solid euro at like the three and four up to like ooh a really thick themey like you know smash your opponent in the face at the higher player counts so i think it's going to have a broad appeal it should have a broad appeal uh to folks that kind of like me you know play every kind of game as long as the game is good i'll play it i don't care what style of game it is i'll just i can know to adjust my attitude going into the game so that's kind of an interesting thing with that is if you're playing with like three players, you can oh it's a nice little euro area control. You can still a little do a little bit of fainting and you know grabbing of certain uh, areas, and then you're gonna have maybe some nice battles at the end. Works fine. It's like a nice euro, you know, with a little bit of events thrown in. But then you you know if you want to have that big sort of epic sweep of a game, it's gonna take a little bit longer. You know you add some more players and there you go. So the game can fill kind of a lot of niches, which is interesting. Uh, you know, components are good, themes nice, all the colors are nice, um, the rule book's really good, um, did I just say all the colors are nice? <laughs> the, the pieces are nice, you know, the marbleized pieces, really cool looking. Uh, the rule book's nice, back to the rules, you know, uh, Fancy Flight gets a lot of crap for bad rule books, this isn't one of them, for sure. Uh, it's the second edition of the game, I understand they've changed some of the port rules, I believe, I never played first edition. Uh, everything makes a lot of sense, and the game is really just, you know, well done. It doesn't take that long to play, really, kind of even from an epic sweep idea. I mean, probably at the outside, four hours, even with, you know, as long as everybody knows what they're doing. A learning game, that doesn't count. You shouldn't count that time with learning games. I would say two to four hours, depending on player count. And you could, I could see this happening. Last time I played it with three... I think we got under two hours. You know, I think we took a little bit of a break to eat or something. I can't remember. But it was really fast. I mean, the first several turns are going to go really quickly because you're just kind of getting off your feet and not really trying to mess with each other too much, uh, at least with the lesser player counts. Uh, with more player counts, you can get in each other's faces a little quicker, so that's a little bit more interesting as well. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, it's really kind of drags you in there and sucks you in. You have the cool card dynamics. You know, when do I use this card? It's not randomized combat. Oh, I was going to talk about those random combat cards. And I think those are actually probably better to be used with a lesser player count. Because as you add more players, uh, the randomness or seemingly random actions of other players is enough randomness to make the game interesting. Whereas if you, again, add on top of that a card flop out of the deck, that can really, you know, kind of maybe not make the game not so pleasant. But with three players, let's say, uh, maybe even four, you could use those cards and just to kind of give you that extra little, okay, I need to get a couple extra forces here so the game doesn't become as calculable. Now, it's still not very calculable because the card play of each player's character cards is somewhat dynamic enough but as you play you're going to kind of learn okay he's got that one card that will zero out my attack value or make me discard the card I just played and have to play another card <laughs> you know you're going to kind of know all that stuff that people are going to have available to them based on uh, you know what class they're, or faction they're playing um, and those cards are pretty cool too they're kind of thematic you know the special abilities on the cards are pretty cool some houses are a little bit more combat heavy and some are more kind of strangely manipulative um, so I think they're a little bit harder to play from that perspective. Like the Lannister combat cards seem a little bit sort of counterintuitive, I think, the first time you play it. But then as you kind of like, okay, well, I can go in and totally win this one, and I can play Cersei and blow up this order token over here and all this stuff. That's a little bit tricky to pull off. Whereas like the, mm, probably the Greyjoys and the Starks are like, you know, you know, they go in there and just like, I can play this card and take Edward Stark back and play him again on the next one. and you know, all that stuff like that, too. So, there's some strange kind of manipulation there, and it's very thematic to sort of the characters. Crazily enough, I know, but it, they do really kind of fit 
the characters, at least from my watching of the TV show. So, I really like this game. It works on several levels for me and fills several niches. And it's got a cool theme that I can relate to because I watch a cool TV show. And uh, that's pretty much it. So, anyway, totally I would get this and take a look at it. From my understanding, there's a couple expansions that play with specific player counts as well. Uh, they give you different win conditions and stuff like that. I'm a little bit scared of that. And I will actually ask anybody that has played with those if you watch this video, hey, will that spoil the TV show for me if I play with those? Because if it does, I don't want to, you know, play with them. And I've read the descriptions of them online. I'm like, Ew, that was a hint. <laughs> you know, I don't know. So if I can play without fear of being spoiled, please let me know in the comments. And so I will grab them and play with them. So maybe review them. All right, so anyway, Game of Thrones works good at all player counts, I'm telling you, it's just different. Um, so don't be sh shy of it, everybody says, because the thing I read here, everybody says, you have to have six, no matter what, you must have six, or I will not play this game with less than six. I don't think I agree with that at all, at all. So I can see three kind of being iffy, but honestly, you know, what I said is what I said. It's a nice little kind of three-player Euro. So there you go. If you want to play Game of Thrones and play the Lannister, Starks, or Baratheons, then go for it. It's still fun. All right, thanks. Thank you.